Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to Breakfast with Sergio. Today is a super special episode for me that you don't want to miss, and I'll tell you in a minute why. And with me, I have Drew Harris. He's joining me all the way from Malaysia. He's a Canadian artist, and we're going to have a great conversation that dates back to 2000. So don't miss it. It's going to be good. Well, good morning, uh, Drew. How are you? Actually, good evening for you. Good to see you. Yes. Hey, uh, I, I'm great. Thank you, Sergio. And uh, what an honor to talk to you. Uh, thank, such thank a you. time difference, too. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Well, let me give a little bit of context to our conversation. So our friends who are watching right now have some idea of, uh, you know, why we are chatting today. Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, back in 2000, when I was an art student, I went to uh, Chicago galleries, you know, to look at the shows and like I would used to uh, every month, you know, to see what was happening. And on a particular uh, Friday, I walked into a Linden Gallery in Chicago, but this was the year 2000, so some 21 years ago, and I saw an exhibition by an artist named Drew Harris. Uh, The artist wasn't there, but I saw the paintings and I was just so touched by them, you know, by the scale, the beauty of the work. It just, it just felt like walking into a place that embraced me in some, in some, uh, uh, you know, spiritual way. And, and I cannot explain it, but it was just created such an impression on me. Uh, as a student, I purchased the catalog of that show. And then I went home and I kept that catalog, you know, in my studio for many, many years. So um, I think then there was another show a couple of years later, which I also went to see in Chicago and time went by, right? This is that 21 years ago. And then just recently, uh, through Instagram, I get a little message from uh, Drew Harris, and immediately uh, it came to my head, like, Drew Harris, this is the artist, uh, the person I know is Drew Harris. So I immediately was curious and look at, uh, you know, uh, the artist's uh, profile on Instagram, and indeed it was the Drew Harris. I had seen the work, but I had never met the artist back in 2000, and now we were having a conversation, and what a pleasure for me today, my friends, to have here with me Drew Harris, which is a, a great accomplished artist, has exhibited around the world, great success in his career, amazing work, it's full of beautiful stories of you know, where his work has been all around the world. And it's more than an honor, you have no idea, uh, to have with me uh, artist Drew Harris now in the flesh, an artist that inspired me in my youth as I was uh, becoming an artist myself and that I had uh, greatly admired for his work and uh, love the trajectory of his work. Uh, now seeing the work that he's doing right now, super strong, super um, also continue to, to, to touch me in the same manner and, and you know the focus that you have kept in the work. But we're gonna unpack a lot of all that stuff right now. So Drew, that was a little introduction to our friends as you and I, we have now already chatted about this, uh, this connection that goes back to 2000. That yeah. was... That was an incredible show. So, uh, Drew, for our friends, uh, again, who are just meeting you because of this little story, uh, tell, tell everyone again, uh, how did you uh, came to Malaysia? Yes, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, the introduction, uh, superb, my friend. Uh, that is the best I've heard in a long time, uh, <laughs> the introduction, and uh, very kind of you. Yes, you know, after the, the, the Chicago show, well, actually, prior to that, uh, I had... Um, I left uh, a business uh, partnership in about uh, late 89 and early 1990 and decided to travel. So I took my son and my wife and uh, we went. uh, We thought we would just travel for a month. And uh, we traveled for about four years. uh, (laughs) And we ended up in, uh, of all places, we, we ended up in Jakarta, Indonesia, and in Bali, Indonesia. And at the time, it seemed to be kind of the route everybody was taking. And uh, we ended up there and I developed a studio in Bali. Uh, from there, I did exhibitions in Jakarta and I went to, uh, I did a show in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, I, upon my return to, to Bali, Indonesia, uh, quite quite accidentally, I was approached by a, a dealer in Singapore and the and the dealer had seen my work. He heard of me through whoever the, the person was and um, purchased the work. And he brought it home uh, to Singapore and had it framed. Mm-hmm. And he was then called upon to, to act to represent the country of Indonesia or Indonesian art uh, oh, wow. at Tresors, which was the first 
art fair in Singapore. Mm-hmm. And they happened to come to his gallery, his small little home gallery. They saw the work. Mm-hmm. They were so enamored with this painting of mine, uh, which I had sold to him for literally peanuts. Uh, <laughs> he said, well, it's Canadian artist. He's really not Indonesian. And uh, they put it on the cover of the book for the Tresor's uh, art fair. And that that really started the career with not only the Asian community, but with this particular rep. Uh, he then subsequently opened up a gallery here in Malaysia. Uh, and at the time, contemporary art was was really a uh, it was kind of new to this this area of the world. There was a lot of traditional work, a lot of new younger artists coming out of the universities here, but there was really only a handful of of abstract painters, and I have to be one of the first foreign artists mm. <clears throat> invited here to a commercial gallery. So I did the first show. Uh, I think in 93 or 94, I think it was. And it was a tremendous success. Mm-hmm. And from that point, I, I, I sort of set my name here as a, mm-hmm. as a regular uh, contributor of paintings and exhibitions and so forth. I was with that gallery for 17 years here wow. in Malaysia. So this became my hub to a certain degree. <laughs> Yeah. Where and the funny part was when I did the the two thousand and two thousand two show in Chicago mm-hmm. was when the financial crisis hit mm-hmm. all of Asia. So I landed myself in a perfect position because I had work and I had two different markets. I had Canada and the U.S. Mm-hmm. in a very heightened financial market, and I had the the Asian market actually coming down and kind of settling during yeah. the Asian crisis, the, the financial crisis. So I just took the work to, to back to Canada and to, to Chicago, which is where you saw it. And that was really how I started. So as, as I did the shows in Chicago, mm-hmm. the Asian economy picked up. I was okay. invited back to do another show. Long story short, many shows later, I happened to meet my wife at the front door of the gallery that I was <laughs> being represented still. Mm-hmm. And we met, and of course, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But now I moved back here. I let Canada go, uh, uh, and I moved here, and I've been here for 15, uh, 15 years now, full mm-hmm. time, in a loft studio uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And now, one of the also, I, I and I still remember very well, you know, when I walked in that show in 2000, you know, and uh, was inspired by the work. And when I purchased the catalog and I was reading your story, I remember very clearly that uh, I mentioned that you had come from a graphic design background. And the reason that was really important for me is because at the time I was studying both, you know, painting and drawing and also graphic design. And in fact, I was uh, uh, working as a graphic designer part time, you know, to help me pay for my education. So that also kind of really resonated with me because like, oh, wow, you know, he's an artist who also has this graphic design background, but he's doing this amazing, you know, fine art work. And and I could see in the work, you know, the presence of the line, you know, the in, in your abstract, more expressive brush strokes, but then there was always something that was very calculated, um, you know, line. And uh, that all, always kind of uh, brought me back to your, maybe your background in graphic design. So uh, take us a little bit to, to you know, how you, uh, Develop into from graphic design into you know your fine art practice. Well, you know you're very observant uh, in seeing that uh, uh, something you and I haven't actually talked about. So that's the I'm I'm impressed that you would see the the both the capacity as graphics mm-hmm. or graphic design interest mm-hmm. put into the paintings. The paintings, yeah, uh, and and still today, the mm-hmm. paintings I'm working on actually today. In fact, are uh, combine both. I, I, I've always felt that uh, a completely painterly painting, uh, no matter who it is, I always want to find some landing point in a painting. Uh, and I find that in my own work, uh, the although you're working to the edge of a canvas, mm-hmm. I sometimes use the bar that I'm incorporating. 
as a landing point, as a structural landing point. It, it balances the painting. Uh, and I, I will add that as the last thing in the painting. Mm -hmm. Many times I'm flipping the painting around and I'm upside down and looking at it in some way it works and then it tells me this is where it needs to be. And almost all the work really I don't feel is finished until this bar, this graphic bar or line comes into it. And I think I, I like the cleanliness of that. Mm -hmm. I like good, clean paintings. I'm not really a painter that, although I'm using abstraction and I'm using methodology of, of the painter, the really painterly painter, uh, I want to sort of clean up sections of it. Where I find something messy in a painting that can't be resolved in, in that one section alone, I'll tend to sort of take a whole section of that painting and block it off. And it balances out the painting. It takes away the rough spot, the thing that I couldn't resolve perhaps in the painting. Yeah. It now becomes finished. It feels finished. Right. I'm also, I also have a, a, a big interest in architecture. Mm. And as my work is, is collected, it's going into some a fairly sizable homes, some well designed homes. And I think, again, the clientele that are looking at my work tend to, to appreciate that, that composition uh, or, the, or the clean uh, structural parts of my painting. So that's really the way to explain it. And uh, today, uh, you know, you know, many, many hundreds of paintings later, it still is there and it's, it's still really a signature. Uh, as you practice graphic design, were you also painting at home? Uh, was that oh. parallel to each other? Was one after the other? I'm really interested to know how did you jump from one thing to the other? Well, I could tell you a very funny story, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I would have to get approval for this story. Uh, <laughs> although I can make it funny and, uh, and you know, it is actually quite real. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I didn't study painting. I studied uh, graphic design like yourself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I studied sculpture and drawing. That was my two majors. These were two my two majors. <clears throat> so I completed the graphic design. And of course, you know, to jump right out of a college environment and then, you know, expect to make money as a as a fine artist, or particularly a sculptor that didn't have a studio, that didn't have materials, you know, and who's going to buy drawings? That's uh, right. my drawings weren't that, you know, good at the time and so I went into graphic design and I spent years going taking my graphic design and going into these you know essentially five fortune 500 com companies so I was going into people like Toshiba FedEx and uh, mm -hmm. some of the banks and so forth and I was presenting their corporate design work okay and behind my presentation was always this fabulous art and I was thinking that's what I want to do someday. I really want to be a painter. And, <laughs> and uh, this is, again, a funny story, but, but my partner at the time was a uh, painter. Uh -huh. And this is about, uh, well, this is probably in the late, late 80s. Okay. And uh, she had, when, just prior to us <laughs> deciding to separate, she had actually bought me a canvas uh, and I really had never painted before so but I had all this inspiration from my corporate guys uh -huh. and so I thought well I took a month off after we had kind of gone our separate ways and I did a painting mm -hmm. and somebody bought it and it was just one of those things where wow I could do another one of those <laughs> and then I started to really research why I was wanting to paint what was it what was I needing to say in the painting and the next thing you know, uh, I became a full-time painter uh, in 1990. Really is really when I decided to, to sever the graphic mm -hmm. design side and, and continue working on my painting. So I worked in, in my living room and, and my corporate guys were still knocking on the door saying, well, you know, are you still doing design or painting? And they're saying, well, I'm only doing painting. Well, let's see the paintings. <laughs> so I would show the paintings, and that was how it really worked. And then as I traveled, that was the way I, I made money. 
uh, <clears throat> for the four years or three or four years that we were traveling pretty extensively through around the globe, really. Um, I would set up little studios and do paintings on canvas. And oftentimes it was my means to sell, uh, to, to make a living as we traveled. So wow. very fortunate. And now it's become, yeah. it is my career. It's my life. It's been this way for 30 some odd years now. So yeah. very fortunate uh, yeah. to have had both. Right. No, I, I love that story. Thank you for sharing. I think that is pretty, pretty cool. And uh, so before the the chat, before we went live, you were talking a little bit about also the business of art, right? Uh, you know, when the work is done in the studio and now enters the marketplace, enters the world, there's a whole different dynamic, a whole different way of thinking and, and uh, going about that. Do you feel like your graphic design career and, and working in the uh you know in that industry and all that experience in some way help you to be equipped to also manage that business side of your career when you became a painter uh you know it's it's been invaluable uh the and i think one of my and i i must say one of the the elements of success in my career was strictly because i had that business background mm. uh, first of all my ability to be able to speak to someone mm -hmm. that is not in my industry that does that knows nothing about art uh but i can present myself at their level so that that was always a an asset that i felt i had based on the history as a graphic designer um uh, i think my understanding of uh timing you know commitment Commitment is one of the things I couldn't just tell a graphic uh, project that I'd been working on. Say I, you know, I need a few more days. Right. I had to meet deadlines, so deadlines are very important. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite. It's almost like my paintings. I'm very structured in the way I do things. So I set up a, an exhibition. I make the exhibition. I make it there. Uh, I make it on time. I do the best work I can. I prepare it the best I can. I ship it the best way. Uh, I can handle all of the the business side of accounting through to uh, just the sheer you know amount of work that goes out. I can manage that singularly on my own. Uh, I think that that we need to do that as 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 artists. That we have to have our left and right brain thinking. We can't just simply sit and wait for someone else to, to do right. the business side. You have to do the business side. I could do much better. I could do a lot better things such as better websites or better social media. I could be on all the social platforms, but I would be spending hours a day uh, on that and rather than painting. So I do what I can. And I, I think it's a, I think every artist needs that. I've always recommended, you know, if you're going to, to become an artist, take a business course, take a business course, learn how to do your taxes, learn how to, to evaluate your work. Uh, you know, th this market is very, it's a, it's a saturated and it's a very competitive market globally. Uh, right. Just go on any Instagram feed and you can see that there are, billions it seems artists producing literally billions of pieces there's a lot of there's a lot of viewing of these pieces and you know you just have to be able to get your work into the right hands right. And a lot of us just rely on you know well let's hope someone sees my social media account uh well you can't do that you have to you have to move in other directions. You have to go around all of that right. to the source that you're trying to get into. De dealers, galleries, uh, museums. Uh, you have to know how to write a proposal. That's another thing. Right. You know, we can't just say, hey, here's my work. <laughs> exactly. uh, let me call. You know, <laughs> you've got to write an official document and the, the way that they want to see it, not the way right. you want to see it. So that's the kind of thing that I can, I pulled from my business. Mm -hmm. you know background but i'm guilty i'm i'm not always as business minded as i could be yeah well i think you know we we can all always improve in different ways and 
Uh, let's also uh, touch base on uh, the type of work that you're doing right now. Something that I also appreciate about, a lot about your work, you know, from when I saw in 2000 to when we reconnected again and started looking at your work again, particularly this series of the Peninsula series, we'd love to hear more about. Uh, is your consistency, you know, throughout the years and uh, your level of devotion to the, the vision that you have for the art that you want to create? So tell us a little bit about this body of work, uh, the Peninsula series that we'll be uh, seeing a little bit here on the screen as we chat about it. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is a very exciting series for me as it's, and I'll get to it in a second, but to give back, to give you a, a, a little chronological history of my work, I've always, <clears throat> I'm a Canadian artist. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of my youth uh, in rural Canada. So not within the cities. <clears throat> until I went to school, you know, into college and so forth. But primarily I was, uh, I was kind of a farm kid, uh, farming country, a lot of nature. And I think it was ingrained in me that nature and environment was so important uh, and it just felt natural to me. So my series work uh, over the years, and, you know, as a graphic designer, again, here's the link. Uh, I'm talking about something that's environmental. My paintings, I, I started uh, a series, you know, back in, uh, I, I don't know, 2000 or, or perhaps after the, the Chicago show, I started working much more environmentally. So I was, I was tending to do my paintings as if we were looking from space into Earth. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time seeing these NASA images that were so high resolution of earth and they were they were just beautiful abstractions and i started thinking how could i how could i work that series so i did a series called the fragile earth series i did a series uh which was again uh one of the reasons this fragile earth series was around was that i was trying to narrate uh the fact that we don't put lines on our on our earth to divide you and and i so as a Canadian and as an American, as an example, we have the longest undivided border in the world. We don't need to have a line. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, someone's figured it out, but we don't have a physical line that you step over mm -hmm. any parts of that. So, but the world has divided itself in that way. So I did these paintings very abstractly with multiple mediums uh, as if we were looking at the world in continents, and it, it was it was a it was a stretch for me. So that and it, the show did very well, uh, and that was the Fragile Earth series. And then I went and did a series uh, called uh, oh, I did one which was the Doppler series, which was all based about radar and landscapes, radar, mm -hmm. uh, very abstract. I did that show for Singapore. And it moved me into uh, a show called The Weather Works, which, okay. again, as a graphic designer and writer, I was thinking, okay, how do I twist it? You know, the weather <laughs> works. Well, the weather works, or the it's the weather works. Mm -hmm. uh, and that series actually started this whole ball rolling. And that uh, I had done a commission for painting okay. in KL, and I had gotten here to do the painting. It was a 12-foot by 12-foot painting for someone's kitchen, believe it or not. <laughs> and I had done this 12 by 12 canvas, uh, and I was so tired. Uh -huh. And I decided I was going to just leave it out on the lawn uh -huh. for the sun to sort of bake it, you know, set it. Well, and I went off to have a nap, and I came back, <laughs> and the painting, had, the rain had come and gone, oh, and no. had literally had painted itself. <laughs> and I thought, bingo, there's... There's nature working in its best form ever. Exactly. I had put the paint down. He had painted the painting. So I started, and I did the whole show that way. I left paintings out overnight uh -huh. uh, in the dew on the lawn so that the paintings, the little animals would track across it and <laughs> snails would go through it. Yeah. And it was an amazing experiment to what came alive at night it was fantastic. <laughs> So that, that really was the, the start of this whole environmental. I'm starting to think about things from nature. Mm -hmm. This series now, which is, has really only been developed 
in the last year since we've since the world has really been locked down. I come from a peninsula in Canada called Bruce Peninsula, just north of Toronto. Uh, a gorgeous piece of land, uh, and I'm f quite fond of it. A lot of my friends and family are there. And I live on a peninsula now here in Malaysia. It's peninsular Malaysia. So I know now quite a lot about this country. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know a lot about that peninsula. So I was trying to mix the two. Uh, and the series really is kind of a reminiscent. Uh, I'm thinking about home. I'm thinking about the water of Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, uh, just near where you are, uh, you know, Superior. And all our nature, our natural environments around these great lakes uh, and then into the Georgian Bay and stuff. So that the colors came from that. The natural blues and the, and the turquoises came from that. And I, again, started to work with just mediums that felt that they were both Canada and here. We're, we're, we are uh, bookended here on, with water. We have, the, we have the Andaman Sea on one side, the China Sea on the other. So, so, we, so I'm, again, water is different here. But I'm trying to reflect the two. So in my titling of each of the works, uh -huh. although abstract, they're very specific to the Bruce Peninsula and then here. And I'm mixing the names so that, because again, through our British history here in Malaysia, some of the names that I grew up with, towns and villages where I grew up on the Bruce Peninsula are, <clears throat> are actually here in Malaysia as well from the, the British occupation and so forth. So we have some connection there as well. So that's how it all comes about. And it really is, it's almost become a uh, landscape. And I've never considered myself really a, a, a visual landscape painter, but they've become softer, they've become gentler. And I think that's that's an exciting new direction for me. Very exciting. Well, yeah. Drew, thank you so much. Just like in 2000, thank you have you. inspired me once again. I cannot <laughs> wait to walk into my studio right after this conversation and get myself to work because it's been such an inspiration talking to you. And uh, as we close, if you could, uh, you know, impart one piece of advice to an emerging artist that may be watching right now this show and got inspired by your words, by your long career, by your work and by your persistence as an artist, what would be just one a quick piece of advice for that artist who's on the other side watching right now, maybe think, thinking, oh, I don't know if this is going to work or it's too hard or whatever the, the mindset blocks may be going on right now. Well, my, my, my advice to anyone is uh, young or old, new or in the mid-career or late career, don't be discouraged. Don't ever let uh, a negative comment uh, or even within ourselves in our own mental state saying we can't do it. No, there's no such word as that. We're all given sort of a God-given you know, talent. <clears throat> Each of us has some talent somewhere. It could be writing, painting, whichever. You will find your talent and don't be discouraged by the lack of, you know, progress. Every artist I know, young and old, successful, not successful, we've all had to go through these transitions where we think, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And we, and self-doubt. Eliminate the self-doubt. Be confident in what you do. The outside sources, your friends, your colleagues, they'll teach you a lot listen to what they say don't take it as discouraged uh, comments be take them as encouraging comments because uh you know you're like a like all of us it, it, we'll have seven different careers in our life like right. you know <laughs> and you will have many uh forms in your artwork and so really just learn from each piece and and do it and yeah it can be discouraging but, uh, and I know it well, uh, many artists do. You yourself, Sergio, probably have had days where nothing's working and you doubt yourself. Do right. not doubt yourself. That is my advice. Uh, no matter what, you've Thank chosen you. to do it, do it. 
Excellent. Well, and with that awesome piece of advice, we finished today's session. Thank you so much, Drew, for your time. It Thank was you. a, a quite extended conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's late for you, so you, you're ready to go to bed, <laughs> which uh, that is awesome. And I want to invite all our friends who are watching or listening to the podcast to uh, visit uh, Drew Harris on uh, his Instagram. You can also Google his name, and you'll find a lot of his work coming up on the Google search. And um, you know, connect with him. Let him know that uh, you know you saw this episode or you heard this episode in the podcast. And uh, once again, Drew, thank you for your time. We appreciate you. Hope to see you soon once again. Hey, thank you so much. I I so appreciate it. I followed you now for just a you know I, recently. I just found you, and it was like I have to follow this guy because. <laughs> He's going to reteach or teach me many things that that I, I have either forgotten or <laughs> never did in the first place. <laughs> Likewise. And, and your work as well. Your work is uh, fabulous. Uh, the center that you're working with, uh, all your creative endeavors, best wishes. And yes, the last thing today, stay safe. Uh, stay safe, everyone. We'll see you, my friends, in the next episode of Life with Sergio. Have a great day. See you in the next level. Goodbye.